everyone, and welcome back to La Caixa. And this week, I'm joined with Oscar as usual, and we're going to start with a very serious matter. While Spanish football in the last decade has provided one of some of the best football in the world with some of the brightest stars in the world, today we're going to start on a somber note as we dive into the case that's been called Barca Gate or Caso Neguera, as some people have termed in the Spanish press. And with Oscar, I'm going to start with you and I'm going to start like, how did you hear about the scandal and what do you think the scandal is for Barcelona? Mm. Basically, Twitter saw something about Barcelona making payments, I think 1.4 million to the co- to a company that's linked with the ex-vice president of the Referees Association or something. Not yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, vice game. president of referees association and then the payment stopped around the time said vice president um left his post yeah yeah this has been super explosive and especially on the madrid side of things in spain because el chiringuito has been like on this for 24 7. there are rumors that it might not be even be 1.4 million that it might have gone all the way back to 2001 in my opinion, mm-hmm. it's a 4.7 million. And the reason why I termed this possibly could be the Spanish cop shuffle. You obviously, like, it has to be investigated. We don't know what's going on. But paying the company of a vice president of referees, even though at, at the moment there's no proof that there has been um, tampering with the games, there has been influence of the games, it's a bit dodgy, no? At best, it's a it it can create a conflict of interest. At best, like if you're saying, even if Barcelona are not if Barcelona didn't like pay any refs or anything, which or like try to influence games, which I hope they didn't. I'm fairly confident they didn't, but who knows with these things. At best. At best, they don't come out of this looking pretty any good in any way because, like I said, it can create a conflict of interest that people can ask about. And at worst, it could be full-blown corruption. Yeah, it could be because, like, th- these are things that, and not to bring up um, Juventus in this, but Juventus are obviously the biggest example of this. And the environment around Juve when the Calcio Police scandal happened was that basically the fans, in the same way the, the environment you can see around Madrid and Barca, where fans are generally s- skeptical about refereeing decision going their way. And if you have that sort of environment to see things like this come out, it doesn't look good for anyone, not for Barcelona, not for Spanish football. And um, two clubs have come out with statements about their discomfort about this, um, Espanol and Sevilla. Three, actually. Well, Atletico. Atletico, yeah, two, mm-hmm. but... And But what Atleti wanted to do was they wanted to do a general communique with the rest of La Liga clubs, but uh, some felt uncomfortable about, about that. Uh, Barcelona said they're already going to investigate this internally. Um, the league president, Javier Tebas, has said that he doesn't rule out referring this case to UEFA and FIFA because La Liga, as an entity based on Spanish sports law, can't punish Barcelona because of some statutes of limitations, but UEFA and FIFA can. So this this can get really messy for Barcelona because you have this thing, you have the Super League going on, and the fact that like FIFA and UEFA are going to be, they're possibly going to use this as to strong ground Barcelona into dropping this, or they could use it, that the same way they're threatening Juve. So it doesn't really look good, and I just wonder how it got this far. I really don't know anything to be honest, and. Um, it's a rapidly developing story. All I can say as a fan is I hope they didn't do anything shady. And obviously, I wouldn't want my club's success over the past years to be tainted anyway. Yeah. Um, that's all I guess I can really say. Yeah. Let the at FIFA and UEFA investigate if they have to. I believe they should punish Barcelona if they find evidence of wrongdoing. If they don't, yeah. okay. 
Yeah. And what, what kind of punishment do you think is um, warranted? Do you feel for, for if, if let's say Barca, let's say in, an, in a dis- different scenario, mm-hmm. Barca is found guilty of, um, there must have been some refereeing tampering, let's say that, because some reports uh, that I've seen have said that Barcelona got information regarding like the referee's personal situation and that I'm not sure where it comes from, but that to me sounds a bit dodgy as well. But like, let's say in the in, in personal the, situation, yeah, Wait, this is different from the scouting reports Barcelona said they paid for as part of the scouting reports. They they got scouting reports about surveys about the referees, so there's mm-hmm. one that they, they did scouts in theaters and that play in like lower divisions. There's one that they did it to scout about referees and I know that's another theory and that theory states that there were some like information, personal information regarding some referees and in that sort of scenario it opens the door to impropriety and if there is impropriety found, what punishment do you think is warranted? Is it just docking points, stripping titles or should it go as far as relegation? I can't really say it has to like I said, depends on what they find. Yeah. yeah. It really does. But let's move on to on the pitch for Barcelona because things off the pitch might be an absolute clown show, but on the pitch it's straight wins. The first time they're beating Cadiff at the Camp Nou since Cadiff got promoted and uh it it was pretty smooth sailing for Barcelona in this one. Yeah, it was yeah, routine win. It took a while to break out this down, but we we're finally able to do it thanks to, you know, um, Ferran Torres having a great night. Yeah. And Barca has this incredible record where they don't, they haven't conceded a goal yet um, from open play at Camp Nou. Roger Marti's goal, do you think it should have stood? I think it should have stood, but giving the referee. The referee, um, our guy, I'm not going to give him credit by naming him this time, <laughs> but he's a referee that blows his whistle for any little team. Yeah. So, given how many games I've watched of this guy, I was pretty confident he was going to give that as a foul when it shouldn't have been. Because I've seen, I don't know if you remember, but Valencia 2 3 Barcelona in 2021. A similar thing happened with Ter Stegen, where he, like it was a little contact. He fell on the floor. Valencia scored. The referee that they gave it, I don't remember what the referee is, but yeah. clearly someone who's a better referee than this guy. So, yeah. I mean, he was giving yellow cards to our players for just shielding the ball from Cadiz players. So, is anyone surprised he ruled out that goal? <laughs> yeah, that is true. That's true. But in Europe, though, Barca, they're a bit in a bit of trouble because the game against Manchester United ended 2-2. Um, for all accounts, a really good game. Rafinha had a great game, but he got substituted angrily. Um, how do you see this going on in Old Trafford, given Manchester United are in good form? And obviously, going away there is will be tough for Barcelona. Uh, yeah, it's really difficult, especially with... You know, Pedri being injured, Gavi being suspended. But I have a mini rant on the home game, first of all. Yeah, go on. Okay, let me choose my words carefully. I can't, we can't say anything <laughs> that will get... Yeah, no swear words, please. <laughs> you have a defense that doesn't concede goals. Why would you change it, Javi? Like, <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. Honestly, it pisses me off. Yeah. Yes, I know Marcos Alonso scored. I know he has played well this season, but he is not Christensen, for Christ's sake. Like, when Christensen comes on, oh, he suddenly look more secure at the back. So I'm hoping, Xavi, <laughs> you know, because he has the tendency to make us suffer with some of his decisions. He's still. A growing coach, he's a growing pain, so hopefully he gets his decisions right. I feel the only big decision he has to make, because common sense should mean Christensen and Baldi starts. If they don't start, then <laughs> whatever. But 
you know, the only decision I think he has to make is whether we go with four midfielders or three attackers. Yeah. And I have a theory on that. I think Lewandowski kind of struggles when we play four midfielders because that's one less forward in support of him. That, that is very true. And who do you think comes in for Kedra and Gabi? Because it might be Kessier, De Jong. Yeah, I mean, Busquets out of necessity. Busquets, he was on the bench against Cardiff, but he didn't play at all. Yeah. So I don't know if he's going to be 100%. But on the evidence of some minutes in the first leg, like, where we were just giving the ball away in midfield, we probably need him. I start De Jong. I start Kessier too. I mean, the midfield picks itself, let's be honest. Yeah, really <laughs> and then, Sergio Roberto after he yeah, yeah, the, the choice is Sergio Roberto as a fourth midfielder or um, Ferran Torres as a winger. And I'm definitely picking Ferran Torres because Fati is kind of out of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in the poor season. And there are rumors that like he might want to leave or it might be sold. Um, given Barca's like, financial struggles, um, do you think it would be wise to sell Asipati to move up from him? It's a tricky one because at one time, at one point, at one, on one hand, he's still young and needs time. And if he's given that time somewhere else, even if we do make a hundred million from him and he goes on to fulfill his world class potential, then, you know, it's one we got to be. We will let go. On the other hand, if we get a hundred million for him and he doesn't do that well, still a win for us. So I don't know. We it's we have to see it by the end of the season. Yeah, we'll have to see. And not too far from Barcelona or really far from Barcelona is Real Madrid. Uh, they won in Pamplona despite the hostile atmosphere. <laughs> Certain players got booed during the moments of silence. Obviously, it's been issues for here, but still, Real Madrid, they, they got the job done in a pretty tough place. And it took them a while, but finally, Real Madrid, like, they always break teams down at the end of the day most of the time. Yeah. It felt like in the second half, um, some little changes on Chelsea made, made Real Madrid progressively more dangerous and... Funny enough, when Asasuna had chances to score was when Real Madrid got the breakthrough. So yeah. that's just hilarious and you not know, expected of Real Madrid. Sure, sure. And Real Madrid, they had a, a youngster come in, Alvaro Rodriguez, who provided two assists. One was ruled out offside. The other one ended up in with a Sanchez goal. Um, what do you think about this kid and his performance? In the small minutes he played, I liked what I saw from him. You know. Um, he, his link-up play was really good. He, how he like carried the ball and everything was good. So, yeah, that to get an assist on your debut, I believe this is debut. You know, can't do you any bad. So, all the best to him. Yeah, and I also think he's Uruguayan, so it's like fellow Uruguayan. He, isn't he Argentine? I think he might be Uruguayan. They, they said my commentator said he was Argentine. Anyway, he's. Okay. Uh, He's a pretty good guy. Yeah, pretty good. Well, let's talk about Real Madrid going forward. I believe the next game is against Liverpool in the Champions League, the first Spanish team in the Champions League competition that we haven't really spoken about <laughs> so far because there have been no real Spanish teams there. But Real Madrid are playing Liverpool. Liverpool, they seem to be back on form. They're winning again. They've won two games back, two games back to back, both of them 2-0. Uh, how do you see this going? Because Real Madrid has to go to Anfield. Yeah, Real Madrid win. What else is there to say? Even if Liverpool were in indomitable form, I still pick Real Madrid. So How come? Because they're Real Madrid. I know, but we have to... Okay, okay. Let me give a, a non-generic answer because this team knows how to suffer if it comes down to that. But they have the quality, you know. They really don't, because we've seen moments this season where they haven't been the same as last season. In that, for, for, for example, like they keep they find it super hard to keep clean sheets, although I think the defense has gotten better. There have been some creative laps in games like against Mallorca, and we have seen them against Villarreal where they didn't really show up. 
and also in the Supercopa final. So yeah. they're team with some problems, I think. Yeah, team with some problems. But that being said, Liverpool is a team with too many problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and Team Madrid will win. Yeah. If they don't win, yeah, if they win, I mean, of course, they're going to win. Yeah, they, uh, this is a team that, at the very least, is little in knockout football. So, yeah, uh, and you know, knock the the um, what do you call it? The nature of knockout football. You don't need to be the better team over ninety minutes. You can just have ten good minutes, and that's enough to kill your opponent. Yeah, and and the schedule is getting really racked up for Real Madrid. Like this, after the game against Liverpool, this is what the schedule is after after today. Liverpool tomorrow, Atletico on Saturday, Barca next week Thursday, Betis the Sunday after that, Espanyol, which should be an easy game though. But after Espanyol, they have Liverpool, they have Barca again, they have Bayern de Liga, so they have Barca again. Um, where do you see Real Madrid? How do you see them performing in this like crazy mini run? Huh? They have a they team to have the potential to win all of them and lose against the Spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I feel for them we have to also go game by game because, like yeah. you said, they haven't been at their best this season. Sometimes they've looked really good. Sometimes they've looked rather average. So, we'll see. I, can, I could say that they do reasonably well, but then... If they have a terrible result against Liverpool, the conversation becomes different. Yeah, it really comes different. But at, the, at the very least, I think they'll beat Atleti at home because once in Atleti to win a Madrid derby is a pointless thing nowadays. <laughs> yeah, let, let's talk about Atleti. Yeah. They, um, honestly, it's been weird watching Atleti in the last, at home in the last two games because one thing they're known for is they have this incredible violent atmosphere, but it's just been quiet because the main ultras, Frente, they're protesting um, the badge, which has been there since I think, for about five years. But all mm -hmm. of a sudden, the season, they're thinking this is season's protest, and it's been quiet so far, and it's, it's made watching athletic games even weird. But that being said, they had a slip-up the week before, uh, they, yeah, they have they had a slip up the week before. No, they didn't slip up. The two weeks two weeks ago, they had a slip up against Hatafe, and this home game, Griezmann he scored a brilliant goal to, to make it one zero and to get the win. And Simeone was a special game for him because he became the La Liga manager with the most games, matching Miguel Munoz. He will surpass Miguel Munoz in the Madrid derby. Miguel Munoz was a famous Real Madrid manager who won a gazillion La Liga titles with them. So. That, that's what makes the next derby so much special. But you, you, you have mentioned that Atleti in recent times, they haven't really done well in this fixture in the Madrid derby. But mm -hmm. do you think that having that extra time is going to help them to prepare for this? Yeah, definitely. The like, extra week off should help them. Yeah. And, and um, they weren't that bad in the Copa, though, in the derby. Yeah, they, weren't, they were not bad in the Copa at all. They, were, they played a good game. But I went to extra time with 10 men away from home. Yeah. So there's only one very possible outcome. And even with ten men, they like got back up and played really well until Vinny um, ended it on the counter. So yeah, there's definitely an opportunity for them to take advantage of Real Madrid should they like get rattled at Anfield like really as the Apple play a high pressing game and that could, in theory, make Real Madrid a bit more tired than usual. Yeah, yeah, it could, in theory. Uh, but for Atleti, their next battle should be seeing if they can finish third. And that might be an easier task than we thought at initially because Rosa Sudad, they're dropping points left, right, and center. And if you look at Rosa Sudad, the one thing that um, stands out to me is their away form is amazing. When I look at their home form, it's not that good. Yeah. Because in at home, Rasa Sudad are the eleventh best team in the league. While wow. away from home, 
They're the third best team in the league. They've won seven more points away from home than at home. That's interesting. Yeah. Like if they yeah. could match their away record, they would be one point with their home record. They'll be one point behind Real Madrid. Yeah, it's kind of a miss. I really can't. I really don't see what they do differently at home than away from home because their style of play is always consistent and the same thing. But in this game, I don't think they played well at all. I thought Celta were the ones who were wasteful with their chances. Yeah. Yeah, the reason why I put that Kyron with the wastefulness is because at one zero Real Sociedad had chances to make it two zero and kill the game because Celta went down to ten men uh, because Renato Tapia said something to La Liga ref and you shouldn't you shouldn't talk to those guys man <laughs> just don't talk to them as Sergio Canales would say <laughs> and um, but after that you're right Celta like they were the ones that really created the most chances. They looked like they were going to score a goal, and it was almost like Real Sociedad just stood there, and they were just non... They, they couldn't respond to it, and this is what could worry me about the fact that they seem to have that advantage in terms of finishing fourth. However, I do see an, I do see a scenario where they don't finish fourth and they finish fifth because they get into this funk where... They can get results over the line, but luckily for them, they're playing Valencia next, so they should win it. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll have to see. I, I, feel, I think Atleti do have the edge now in terms of getting um third because Real Sociedad also have Europa League to contend with when that resumes. Yeah, yeah, they, are, they also do have that, but next week we shall see because on Saturday it's the Madrid Derby first, then Valencia Real Sociedad, so that should, should be two really enticing games. Uh, speaking of enticing, let's talk about Sergio Canales, and he was in fine form, and Betis' win against by the lead, and this was Betis' first win at home since before the World Cup. I, I think um, Adam West from La Liga TV was saying they hadn't won since October 16, yeah. which is a misleading stat because of the World Cup, but like that's mm-hmm. still a long way to go. Yeah, this was yeah their first home win of the year. Betis haven't really been in good form until recently. Wami came back and then they started scoring goals again. Yeah. But they were also conceding a lot. So, um, I mean, it's a good thing because it makes their games more watchable because I was thinking Betis have been kind of a letdown so far this season, but yeah. You know, one means a, a very important player to the attacking dynamic, and it's good to see him score again. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. They have been a letdown, but one thing we have to remember is that they have suffered tremendous injuries. Mm-hmm. And they've had lots of absences. Also, the red cards, the fact that they're the team, luckily for them, they didn't receive a red card, even though Canales faced his arch nemesis, Mateo Laos. But in terms of red cards, they, they're the team in La Liga with the most red cards. I believe they're 11, they have 11 red cards or 10 yeah. red cards. And, it was a good record every other game. Yeah, and when you have that, it's very, very difficult to compete. It's very difficult to compete because I remember there are games against Valladolid in the opposite uh, fixture where if they had 11 men, maybe they would have won, or the game against Salta where if they had 11 men in at Balaidos, I think they would have won as well. But yeah, like it's they haven't really done well so far, but I do think they're pushing in the right direction. I do think maybe they're going to give Atleti or Real Sociedad a run for their money. At the moment, they're six points away from Real Sociedad. They have the head to head against Real Sociedad, four points away from Atleti, but Atleti, seem, Atleti have the head to head against them. So if they can beat Real Sociedad at the Via Marine, and that's just three points. Like Brussels are realistically they're one loss away from giving Betis the um not the advantage, but like from Betis giving Betis the destiny in their own hands to finish in the Champions League. Yeah. Well the thing is that when you said Russell said might not finish in the top four altogether, I was thinking it could happen, but the chasers this is not largely been inconsistent too, so I, it wouldn't shock me if Atleti become inconsistent again. Yeah. It would also not shock me if 
Atleti or Real Sociedad or Real Betis just went on a run and put a distance between the rivals. So yes, it's pretty inconsistent but exciting because they're like, okay, who's going to get this fourth spot? Yeah, yeah, it's like it's been it's been like that all season long, and a team that's their definition of inconsistent but exciting is Raya Vallecano. And Florian Lejeune, he scored the goal, but like should have been on the pitch for that game because his tackle on Oliver Torres was outrageous. Like if Oliver Torres did a couple of rolls, cried, I think it would have been a red card for Florian Lejeune. Yeah, you know referees in Spain, the, <laughs> the, the referee based off the emotion and screams and everything, you know, how dramatic it can be. But I'll say fair play to Oliver for not rolling around because... It's not really a good look when players are just acting as if they've been shot. But yeah, yeah I think Legend could have, should have been sent off. Yeah, but he did He did get the goal, the controversial goal that made it 1-1. Sampali was complaining because he believes that a place like that should go to VAR, and I think I think he should have gone to VAR. But for Rayo, they are they're somewhat like in that zone where they're super inconsistent. They're doing really well, but... I'm not. If they end up in the European zone, it's going to be with respect to how badly other teams like Villarreal, who we'll get to, are doing. Not because like they've done really well, but mm-hmm. I just think that maybe if they finish seventh or sixth, it'll be a casual. It'll be a casualty. It'll be a circumstantial thing rather yeah. than it being Rayo or like super Rayo. Although they are like a really fun team to watch, and I do really like them. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Some of the chasers have been largely out of form. Like, Atletico Club just got back to form recently. I mean, losing to Atletico is not a shame. At the Wanda Metro, Civitas, sorry, Metropolitan. Yeah. But, you know, you require more consistency from any team that wants to get into those top European places. Yeah, and we talked about the battle for top four, uh, which is between Real Sociedad, Atleti, and Betis, I think, at the moment. But in terms of the battle for the rest of the European spots, that's Rayo, Athletic Club, Mallorca, Villarreal, Osasuna, and just four points separates these five teams. So we're talking about a situation that could radically change. Like Mallorca could finish in the European zone. So as well as Osasuna, either through the cup or if they do win the cup or through the league. So it's something that's super exciting. It's something that's really incredible at the moment. Mm, and, yeah. Yeah. And the weird thing though is that if Sevilla had won this game, I think that I think you could start to include them in the conversation for finishing in the top six, which is outstanding. <laughs> and if Sevilla finish above Villarreal and Athletic Club, the two clubs have to look at themselves and be like <laughs> What did we do? Like worst case scenario for the cha- for all the European teams is if Sevilla have somehow get to the top four. <laughs> and it this kind of crazy thing has happened before. I remember Marcelino's last season in Valencia. I'm sorry if I bring up painful memories, <laughs> touch, but <laughs> like at, at one point in the season they were looking over their shoulder at relegation and then they went on this crazy one run and got top four. So yeah. it can happen. I don't think Sevilla themselves have it in them to push higher than eight, if I'm being honest. Sure. But at home, there's a different team because in this game, it was an away game. They weren't. They're a different team home. against relegation fodder. <laughs> but, but you can't call PSV relegation fodder, although PSV, they dominated the first 30 minutes of that encounter. I wasn't even talking about PSV. But yeah, yeah. yeah, let's give Sevilla a candidate. I thought PSV would get into them some months ago, but Sevilla have improved to a good amount. Yeah, and Lucas Ocampos, man, he his cameo in that second half was shades of Lucas Ocampos I fell in love with in 2020, 2021, 2019, because he was his goal was outrageous. The fit, the finish, the take, and then his assist for the second one was world class. Like I really enjoyed. It that cameo, that 15 minutes where they just ripped apart PSV. But I do I do think the scoreline really flatters Sevilla, but going into Eindhoven, um, which is uh, a big place for them, because I think that's where one of the European 
uh, year for the Eagles one, either 2000, the 2006 or 2007 one. But going into the like the that big results, you would assume they wouldn't do anything to cause that collapse. Like it's, it's a certainty, but as Liverpool has taught us, we can't really we can't really be sure. So I'm happy okay. that they improved. So yeah, I got my. I, I see your revenge. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, shall we move on to another Barcelona boy, former Barcelona boy? Our boy Piqué Setién, he's he's in trouble, isn't he again? Yeah. Okay, now Villarreal fans actually have a valid reason to shout Kiki out. <laughs> Before it was, I I thought it was a bit silly, like he just got there, but now, you know, I'll ask you a question. What do you think Villarreal's biggest problem is? I I think their biggest issue right now is that defensively they've lost a lot of the organization that they had. With Unai Emery, sure, that, that, that's, that's one. That's true enough. Another mm-hmm. issue that they have is Gerard Moreno, in that when he's on form, he makes them such a great team, like we saw against Real Madrid. But when he's out of form or when he's missing, they look like a pure mid-table team. Yeah, like the amount of goals they've scored this season is too low for a team that wants to finish in Europe. Yeah, it's, uh-huh. and they're conceding goals as well, like 22 goals already, which isn't too yeah. bad. But compared to a Unai Emery team, that's usually very more organized. Like yeah. this and you just got, uh, you just remind you of a point I thought of when I was watching this game. If you let Mallorca score four against <laughs> you, <laughs> plus, I think all of us in the like, uh, Liga group chat were all like 1 0 Mallorca. We were that comfortable, like, okay, Villarreal. I have lacking punch in offense. They're missing Jared. But I could just score the one goal and frustrate them. Yeah. But four. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, like Villarreal, they were down to 10 men in this. Um, yeah, but yeah. they were one nil down at that point already. Yeah, so. They were. But, but the, yeah. thing, the thing, though, with them is that when, actually, when, when they got, when it got back to 2-2, I was like, oh, wow, they, they have a chance to win this, even with 10 men. Because Mallorca, they... They haven't been in good form, Mallorca themselves. So, but it's just that like they have so many defensive lapses. Like even the first goal, you're like Pepe Reina. You were talking about I was like <laughs> Manolo Reina. He, no, he's, he's not that. He's not that bad. No, he's not that bad. no, but but he did a, do a Manolo Reina impression with that pass. Like he, tribute act. Yeah, <laughs> in Manu, in front of Manolo's former team. <laughs> yeah, all these and old he, guys, man. <laughs> yeah. Talking about, I mean. It's not like Jorgensen is any better, let's be honest. No, no. <laughs> yeah, Jorgensen is mistake against uh, Rayo. Uh, yeah, I was just more. like... Uh, like, yeah. Villarreal, I know it's very easy to say this now that they're losing four games in a row, but I always thought that they left the transfer window a much weaker team than they went into it. Yeah. Because Danjuma left, you have um, um, Nicholas Jackson who's injured, there's, I was like, any injury to Jared Chukwizi or um, Pino will be problematic. And as we've seen, Jared has been injured in the last two games. They've not, they've, they've scored today. They scored yesterday, but it's not been looking too good for them. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Jose Luis Morales and his transfer to Villarreal? Because in the summer, like we're all excited about him. We thought like this could be a potential like game changer off the bench and. And someone who had the quality based on what he's done is at Levante, but it hasn't really worked out for them, even though he scored on the weekend. Yeah, he's most to be fair, I think it's down to Emery mostly using him in conference league games and at times he's only brought him on the eighty eight minutes of a La Liga game, so I can't really attach too much blame to Jose Luis Morales himself. He's just as guilty as anyone else for missing sitters that they should have scored like, yeah, against Barcelona the other day. But, you know, um, I don't think he's having a bad season. He definitely could be better. And if he gets a run, I feel if he gets a run of stats, he'll show his quality. Yeah, like we're, we're all waiting for that. But let's talk about Mallorca because they are doing really well. Um, they are they have the same points with Villarreal. What's 
what's the ceiling for them? Because we we look at this European race. There's obviously there's Osasuna, there's Rayo, there, there's Mallorca, who are they're somewhat there based off circumstances because Sevilla is having such a historical bad year. Villarreal is in chaos. Valencia is in worse than chaos. But out of all this, like these three teams that we don't expect to be there, who do you think has the potential to go all the way if there is a chance? Like, can Mallorca finish? in the conference league spot? My logic would tell me, Rayo, because they have very good offensive weapons and more than um, the other two teams in Asasuna and Bayerka. And their defense is relatively good. And they have a very good goalkeeper. Well, the way Mallorca keep just dominating home res- not home games, but home results, like getting good results at home. You know, like we were saying before the game, one nil for them at home is a sure thing now. Yeah. It will not surprise me if Mallorca finish above those three teams. No, it, it won't surprise me either because, like, we spoke about their home record, but let, let's look at teams that they've beaten. They've beaten at BB Atletico just for the World Cup. After the break, they beat Valladolid at home. They beat Celta Vigo, they beat Real Madrid, and now they're beating Villarreal. Like, and Villarreal, Real Madrid, and Atletico Madrid, those are big scalps to take at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And basically, they had hunters in this league. And yeah. I, I mean, it's good. Yeah. Last season, I was like, I didn't want them to get relegated because I wanted to see how far the Mallorca owners can take this project. And unexpectedly, I don't think anyone would have expected them to be eight by this point. Even I, this season, I was like, based on how other people have strengthened, I think they'll be tough to beat, but they'll just get relegated in 18th. And they're massively proving me wrong. Yeah, they are. Let's move on to another overachiever. Like, the saying used to be always watch Betis, but I think we have to change it to always watch Girona because of people course. are looking for excitement. Girona is the place to be. Like, in terms of goals in their games, they have you're guaranteed three goals per game with Girona most of the time. Yeah. 66 goals have been involved in Girona games, which is more than Barca, it's more than Real Madrid. I believe they're the third highest top scorers in the league. Yeah, they're the third highest top scorers now. Which, which is impressive. And in this game, they ripped apart on Maria. Yeah. It, was, it was murder. Yeah, and it was like really top quality football. Like you have... I think for the sixth goal, you have Ivan Martin doing a, f- a flick assist that, you know, you do to take the mickey. Yeah. And yeah, uh, Jordan, I just overall really enjoy to watch because if they don't score or create many chances, they'll give away lots of stupid chances. So either way, you know, you're going to get entertainment with this team. Yeah. And, and what makes them so good and so entertaining? Is this just the setup? Is it the fact that they they come from the city school of... Um playing style, or is it Michelle who's been such a good manager? I think it's a combination of all of these teams. I also like their like, transfer strategy of like incorporating lots of young players, young players with a lot of flair and excitement, like Raquel May. They've added Chikankov into teams, and Chikankov is a you know very good player, so I believe he'll provide more goals. He scored his first goal for them today. I'm sorry, this match day. Yeah. And I feel another thing we haven't talked about is the fact that their defenders are just not good. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, even the, the, the second goal Maria scored, what was Santi Bueno doing? Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> with yeah. those, with, with, with mediocre defenders and a very enterprising way of attacking and enterprising players, of course they're going to be entertaining. <laughs> and yeah, like you said, we have to give Michelle credit. Yeah, because he, he's done, he's done a really fantastic job. And, the one thing he said when he first came to, uh, when he first got Girona promoted, is that he wants to prove his style of football can work in the first division. He filled at Huesca, he filled at Rayo, but I think we're starting to see his blueprints. And for me, they're the yeah. new Levante. Like they've taken the place that Levante used to take, where they were that one team. Levante were that one team where you know you're going to be have a fun game, and now Girona yeah. is that team. I don't want to say they're a new Levante in the sense that they they don't like terrorize Madrid and Atletico yet. Yeah, but Madrid haven't gone to Montelivi neither of Atleti. 
So oh, true, true. So it uh, and to be fair, and to be fair, they did draw it Real Madrid, and they should have beaten Atleti. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah they should have. But now we've spoken about the good about this game. How, if you're Ruby, what do you say to the players when you're four zero at halftime, not to Real Madrid, not to Barcelona, not to Atleti, but to a fellow relegation struggler in quotation marks, a fellow team that got promoted? What do you say to your players? That was awful. The performance was awful. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I just remember another team. To show how bad that performance was, I think there was one of the goals, I think it was Castellanos, where both he and Rodrigo Ricami were at the back post and no one was near them. Yeah. Like, honestly, if I'm Ruby, I'll... Have you ever seen this video where a coach is slapping players at halftime? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. You could do that, but then I also think he could... If you, you don't lose 6-2 and be uh, have your hands clean as a manager, so... No, no. No, you don't. And the problem for them is next up, they, they have Barcelona is going to come. They're very, uh, very close to the relegation zone. Uh, uh, the good news might be they have the area after Barcelona, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, if they lose both games, because like these are games where they could lose and they could find themselves in the relegation zone, um, do you think it's time for Maria to push the panic button, or do you still give them patience? I don't think they should push the panic button, because let's be honest, like you said, if Villarreal get their act together and if Barcelona keep doing what we're doing, there's n- there's little chance for them to win or get any points from those two teams. So I feel, who who are they playing after Villarreal? Who are Maria playing after Villarreal? So next up is Barca, then they have Villarreal, then they go to Sanchez Pichuan, which will be mm-hmm. very tasty. So you can already write up three of those results, but after that they have Cardiff at home, and then and then Andalusian derby. Uh, and it gets complicated because they have Salta after that. They have Valencia, which might be an easy game or, or, or a tough game, depending on how good Valencia is. Then Atleti, then Atleti. Um, Hitafe away, Real Madrid away. Yeah, you get, you see my point. They're in a tough, they're in a bind. Yeah. Um, I, I think they've been essentially terrible before this game. They've had some good results, some bad results, and then this one is just... The kind of result that will make you worry and maybe overthink things. So. Yeah, it's the type of result that makes you doubt the manager. And the one thing that Almeria they haven't really done well is that their away form has been nothing to write home about. They have no mm-hmm. wins away from home. They have the same away record as Elche. Oh. Yeah. Well. Who knows, maybe a shock 2-1 win for them next week will change things. Yeah. You know, some people are complaining but some other games are boring. So, you know. <laughs> maybe we need to spice things up. I'm just joking. Yeah, uh, um, I feel we have to... They, they shouldn't suck Ruby because... Part of the reason they struggled is because you kind of sold him short in the transfer window by selling his best player. Yeah. So late. Yeah. And but they've made and some good signs. Yeah. yeah. The they... They'll say that. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. They'll say that they brought in uh, Luis Suarez from Marseille. They mm-hmm. brought in Leo Batistao. They brought in um, Baluk Dore. They kept a lot of the basic blocks of the team. So he should get something out of this team. Yeah, but it is a tough run there. They, yeah. they place better. They played well in that game to be fair to them, just lost to a better team. And they're facing Barcelona, Villarreal and Sevilla, so yeah. I I think they should stick with him until like it gets really bad. Like maybe an international break will be coming on, like just assessed by then, you know, if you're going to suck suck him, suck him, get a coach to come in, have two weeks to, you know, get used to the players. Yeah, that's right. And if they do, like, do you have any coach in mind that could rescue them somewhat? That's what I was also thinking about when I was like, they shouldn't suck him because I can't really think of any coach that will just come in, 
Borderlands. Borderlands will, Borderlands will shake things up too much for them in the middle of the season. I feel that's an appointment you could make over the summer, not the yeah. yeah. season. Well, that game against Cardiff will be the like big game because that's the game right before the international break. So we'll keep our eyes focused and see what happens. But for now, we're going to go to the bottom team in the league, Elche, who were beaten by Espanyol. And Sergi Dada scored a great goal to give Espanyol that lift. And now they're swimming away from danger, Espanyol. Yeah. But, you know, the nature of this state table, yeah. one loss next week and you're swinging right back, you're sinking back right back into danger. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was a good in, individual goal from Darda, you know, beating Elche, who got some encouragement the other week, but now that encouragement seems to be, you know, a long time ago. Yeah, and it's, like, like right now, like, we have to say that they're, although mathematically Elche aren't done, they're, they're done. They're done. But they're you done. know something that annoys me? What? I like Villarreal, right? They're all my favorite teams in the league after my own club. So for them to just take three points off Villarreal and <laughs> those three points not matter, it, yeah, it, it's it, annoying, but you know, yeah. <laughs> to take you know every, everyone has to fight for their points so you know yeah. well done they have to, they have to fight whether i like it or not yeah to take three points from the real and give it to espanol <laughs> yeah. I, I, I haven't even gone i i, I don't <laughs> want to talk about that one but <laughs> yeah it's yeah they, there's no way they to be honest with the club we might be about to get to they're sinking so fast that Elche might finish up with them. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, but let, let, let's, the good news for Espanol to just wrap up on them is that next they have Mallorca. And Mallorca, although they're good at home, they're terrible away from home. So that should be a bad current. They should possibly get Esp- Espanol ain't that good at home, too. No, yeah, that, that is true. So, they're only at 10 points. So one one. Yeah, one one. One one. one Everyone yeah. go home. Yeah, one one. And now for the main events. So, the last <laughs> the horror show that's Valencia uh, wow every Valencia game has a certain script and I'll say the script Valencia start well they create mm-hmm. good open clear cut chances they mm-hmm. miss those set open clear cut chances mm-hmm. they go into the halftime break level in the second half they don't show up the other team scores game set match and this is what happened to against Atafe and the thing with Valencia is if you're playing against a team you sh- and you have a new manager who is Baraja and you have that new manager bounce and you're playing against a team where the crowd are against your current manager, which should tell you something about how well that team is doing this season. And you still proceed to lose. This is worrying. Yeah, like... Very worrying. From both teams, I'll be honest, watching this game was kind of hard because <laughs> there are two teams that you expect much better of play, playing some, making some very poor plays, you know. The only player in the pitch that looked any good, I'll be honest, if I'm not being honest, is Mauro Yeah. Because he saved Valencia a couple of times but couldn't do anything about that. My goal. You have Porto on the likes stinking up the pitch. <laughs> yeah. and, and I know I'm complaining, but it does has to say that even though Hatafi won, they still don't look very convincing because it's just there's just an overall lack of ideas in them. Yeah, there is and and from a Valencia perspective this was possibly the game to win because mm-hmm. this puts pressure like Kike Sanchez is possibly going to go is like I think he's on board time at the moment so except he can do something but if to get that balance, this was the perfect team because this is a team that's doubting a lot this season, the mm-hmm. next moment of the season, and to get the confidence in because you look at Valencia, the next game is against Rosa Sudad, and Rosa Sudad, like they'll be licking their lips because they messed up last week. Uh, I'm sorry, this week, and they would look at Valencia and they would think this is a good opponent to get three points against. Yeah, and after Definitely. Rosa Sudad is Barcelona. Then Osasuna, ah, let's go. 
Right. All these clean sheets, just, I'm not always calling them wins anymore. I'm calling them clean sheets. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we're going to win, but is it going to be a clean sheet? <laughs> I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures. Who knows? Both Almeria and Valencia could beat us. <laughs> I hope not, but, you know. Okay, jokes aside, this game really made me fear for Valencia. Before I was like, they're just down there now, they'll get up. But now you look and you're like, how are they going to get up? Yeah, especially when Daria gets injured and I think it might be a bit bad. So yeah. and the thing that worries me is that you bring in Ruben Bahaha, who I get is a club legend, but his track record isn't oh, yeah. anything to write home about. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder if you're better off because Valencia, they improved in terms of their salary limits. You're better off spending all of that salary limit on a qualified manager, a manager who you can pay 4 million euros to save yourself because that 4 million euros you're going to spend to save yourself will be much better than the discounts you're going to get next season when you're in La Liga. But it seems like Peter Lim doesn't see things that way. And going after someone like Baraja when you're in the relegation zone for me, it's a very stupid decision, but I hope I'm proven wrong, and I hope Mr. Baraja can do something well for Valencia. But I, I don't, I don't see it happening. Yeah, it seems like this is, and it seems that will relegation actually be a good a blessing in disguise long term? Because no, it, it if it doesn't be. happen this season. If I'm being honest with you, it's going to happen next season or the season after next because this has been a slow but steady decline in yeah. of Valencia. No earlier because is this it's in this same fixture almost two years ago that Valencia lost three mil and Gabriel was crying after the game. Yeah. I don't think Valencia were in the bottom three then. Yeah. Now, fast forward two years later, they're well into the bottom three and Gabriel, although he didn't cry this time, he was having a meeting with the fans after the game. So yeah. it's, it's not a good look. The reason why I don't agree that relegation will be a blessing in disguise is because although there will be that parachute money and Valencia will possibly get a lot of parachute money, it's that the squad is not there to fight relegation the way it was there for Villarreal. Uh, or the way it is for Levante right now. And yeah. if you look at the second, the Segunda, it doesn't have as much investment as the championship, but there is some investment there. There are like some um, US slash Mexican investors who are putting some amount of money into teams with better projects than Valencia is. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to end up like Zaragoza, who has been there for 10 years, or Rasin, who are just like, or Malaga. Oh, Malaga is the worst. Malaga is what, not what you want to be. No, and, and given the ownership structure, unless they sell the club because of relegation, I doubt, I really doubt it would be a positive thing because it's it's just going to keep... Yeah, that's why I was saying it might be a positive thing because Lim might finally go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he might, but who knows? Like, it might just put the money that's meant to be for Lim Mestia into, this, into the team. And yeah, it's it's just chaos right now. Mm. But yeah, let's talk about less about Valencia, uh, more about uh, a bit about the upcoming Champions League fixtures. Um, so there's going to be Eintracht Frankfurt versus Napoli. Napoli are in blistering form. Eintracht, they're doing they're doing okay, and they won this weekend, I believe. And how do you see that going? I see Napoli just continuing their incredible form and. Beating Eintracht in a close game. Because I think Eintracht will definitely put... This is like their golden goose this season. So they'll definitely make more of a game of it than people will think. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think people are underestimating Eintracht. Yeah. Especially, at, especially at home. I feel there's a surprise here at home at least. And then away from home, Napoli can take care of everything. Yeah. And then let's move on to... Leipzig versus Man City, and this should be a bank for Man City, should I say? Man City have their strange team, man. <laughs> like, you beat Arsenal, 
in a game where, to be fair, Arsenal should have won, but you end up winning 3 1 somehow and then you draw with Nottingham Forest. The week before you lose to, I think you lose to Spurs, but anyway, I don't know, I, I can see a funny result here. <laughs> okay. okay, Mr. Predictor, you actually you got Milan versus Spurs, right? So, um, yeah. So maybe Did I get that right. wrong or right? You got it right, you got it right. You said Milan would win. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that Spurs have a goalkeeper injury, although, to be honest. Yeah, me not me. playing Loris is kind of an advantage these days. <laughs> yeah, okay. You also got the Dorban call, right? So, Bowers were there too. I didn't really call that game. I just said I hope Dortmund don't disappoint. <laughs> but, you know, fair play to Dortmund. They, yeah. They play a very good game. Okay, and the final yeah. one is Inter Porto. How are Porto doing? I haven't really been following them. Well, they, they've improved in the Portuguese league. They're, they're now second, which is what should be where they should be Mm -hmm. um in the champions league i felt they started really poorly in their group i believe they lost 4-0 to club Mm -hmm. but they they roared like a lion to finish uh first in the group so uh it should be it should be a fun one inter milan they've improved ever so slightly and in Serie A, they're they're no they're nowhere near Napoli at the top of the table. They're they're near in terms of position, but in terms of points, they're nowhere near them. So, hmm. um, I I do think this would be fascinating because Porto tend to do really well against Italian teams. So, um, we'll see what happens. Uh, given that Inter at home in the first leg, you know, I'll be brave and go for a draw. Draw, right? That's because a draw will make things interesting going back to Porto. um, Porto Stadium. Yeah. So a draw. A draw. Hey. And with that, that concludes our podcast. Thank you so much for discussing this with me. I know we had to touch on touchy subjects for both of us, but it was a fun discussion nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. I just hope, you know, and Barcelona don't get like I, I oh, basically, they've, basically they've not corrupted the integrity of the league because yeah, yeah. that was still kind of, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a shame that La Liga has fallen the trajectory of Serie A in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, but if, you, if, yeah, but if you ask me what I personally think, yeah, my emotions, my, my bias might obviously come, but personally, I think this is just Barcelona being clumsy and not... <laughs> Because let's be honest, Barcelona have done really clumsy things. Like, yeah, I haven't heard one thing about paying like a reason for paying refs is so that they give neutral decisions. Basically, you're paying refs to yeah. not give. Well, that, that's not. I mean, that's what. That's something I heard. Yeah, but and not- it's so stupid. I think Barcelona are capable of doing it. So, but but Oscar, that that's the definition of influence in a game. Yeah, true. It is influencing the game to be... <laughs> well, the intention is to influence to be neutral. I mean, it's kind of... Yeah, well, I, I feel whatever comes from this, it's like, no... Like, even the thing with gifts, like getting... Like, Rummager sometimes do that, and I think other clubs do that. Like, they give referees gifts. Like, that should not be allowed at all. You shouldn't... Like, you should only talk to the referee mm-hmm. in a neutral setting, or when you're telling them to take his backside out. That, that's the only time you should talk to the referee. Like, you shouldn't be, like, cozy, cozy with referees. I, I don't. Yeah. It, it's just the uh, impropriety that, that gets, I'm sure, yeah. people the wrong way. Yeah, I, I guess it isn't a perp. It, it could be criminal and illegal, but the best case scenario that Barcelona can get is they're innocent, but this is inappropriate overall. Yeah. Because the, the thing, though, is, like, if it's inappropriate... But it's um, it's legal. It still puts um, I I feel it still puts a black mark on the competition because people on Twitter and like we all know like journalists um, in a certain island, small island, they have an agenda against Barcelona. Uh, Real Madrid fans have an agenda against this result, and it just puts a dark dark. Uh, the whole of the league has an agenda against us. Let's be honest. No, so. no come on. No. Uh, not like it's not that bad, but definitely you have some fans that will take it too far and be like, "Oh yes, I always knew this club was a cheating 
Yeah. And his club was Juventus Senior. Yeah. Yeah, but to be to be fair, for Madrid, I think what would be like people would be saying the same thing. So people will say the same thing if it's yeah. Madrid. So yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll keep you in like inform the listener. We'll if anything comes up, if nothing comes up, we'll just keep on talking about Spanish football and the good part about it. But uh, thank you, listener, for listening all the way. Um, and we hope you like this and give us a like and a comment. But for now, we're going to say adios and goodbye.